So this is now our uh, third, yeah, yeah, September, October, November. This is our uh, 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 third, no, our second, I'm sorry. This is our second book club uh, meeting for the fall, for the autumn, October, November, and one in December. And uh, we have tonight a relatively new member, I, I believe, of our 19th Century Committee and Sabre, yeah. uh, Larry Dake, uh, who has taken on uh, a really important book, uh, one that uh, most of us anticipated <laughs> for a couple of years coming, uh, being published. Uh, this is John Thorne's uh, Baseball uh, in the Garden of Eden, uh, The Secret History of the Early Game. That's an enticing title. And I remember John uh, being on our first panel discussion at, at the Fred. Of course, uh, uh, he was uh, also a keynote speaker that year. It was in 2009. And that panel discussion had all to do about writing, uh, researching and writing and getting published. And uh, John was one of our panelists, and he talked uh, a little bit, you know, about his forthcoming book that did come out in 2011, uh, Baseball Before We Knew It. And uh, Larry, uh, we're anxious to uh, <laughs> uh, have you uh, take part in this discussion before sure. I lead this and moderate this discussion. Uh, Bob does have a few uh, general ground rules that we just try to stick with. And, uh, you know, I, I think do we have a, we could probably do it by just raising hands, right? Yeah, I, I think the uh, with the book club, the discussion is important. So you, you just kind of chime in uh, mm -hmm. if it's okay with Larry uh, course, as yeah. we go along uh, uh, with questions or comments or uh, uh, try to, to uh, guide us. I, before uh, Larry starts, he's working on a uh, uh, bio project uh, biography of Fred Oddwell. And Oddwell is one of my favorite <laughs> people from early 20th century. He played four years with Cincinnati and from 04 to, I think, 07. Mm -hmm. And in 1905, he led the National League in home runs with nine. <laughs> and I, I believe that's the lowest number to lead a league. I'm not sure of that, but I think think that's pretty close. But Larry, we look forward to the uh, discussion yeah. tonight, and you're ready to go. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. I certainly, um, I was just going to say, I saw Fleischmann's Athletic Club. I'm from Walton originally. So when I, I remember, you know, this is sort of pre-baseball reference, looking in baseball encyclopedias as a kid and saw you know, these low home run totals and the home run Baker led the league with like eight. Right. And so once I got into some baseball reference and really started diving in, you know, I see this guy is from Downsville, New York, <laughs> and led the league in home runs. And as I've gone through the old Walton reporter newspapers, he stays really active in local baseball throughout his life. He goes into real estate. Um, so I'm looking forward to kind of taking all that and trying to put it into something coherent. But, um, you know, I saw you pop on as well, and 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 I just think that's awesome. And obviously, been following everything that your group's doing with Doc Adams and folks like that. So I figured that might be a good place to start. Um, so yes, I I am from from upstate New York, originally from the Oneana Cooperstown ish area. Uh, now a school superintendent just north of Binghamton, New York, and you can see Shenango Valley's on there. I'm at work, and I I can't change that. Um, it's a 1700 school district student school district in in our part of the state um so thanks for thanks for allowing me to try to tackle this this great book here so i've got a, a bunch of questions and I, any one of them probably would be worthy of an hour discussion so we'll kind of just see where it goes um so starting at the beginning you know and i think everyone and i certainly did knew somewhat of the story of of double day and Cartwright and all these kinds of things. But the secret history that Thorne presents, he presents sort of Cartwright as kind of like the undouble day. You know, he was kind of the foil of the foil, ended up being a foil. But there's lots of other names that he puts out there in chapter two. Um, you know, from your reading, like what are the other creators or enhancers of this early game? 
that you think deserve a seat at that that like last supper of baseball creators and i'll kind of open it up there and we'll see where it goes and if that question is terrible i've got other questions we <laughs> aren't as bad <laughs> Well, well you've got Doc good. Adams, obviously, as a as, as as one who's who's got a lot of su support from members of the committee and people outside the committee. Uh, but I think any of those folks that were developing the rules uh, mm -hmm. in those days, Wadsworth, uh, for example, uh, were were important people who added certain features to the game that are still mm -hmm. with us. Yeah, <laughs> I was a very uh, adamant uh, Cartwright follower. Uh, in, you know, when I first started reading about 19th century baseball in, in the 1990s, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, ascribed to Cartwright right away. And uh, in fact, I even uh, I had friends in Hawaii uh, that members of convent nuns that uh, their seventh, their convent was next to the cemetery Cartwright was buried in. So mm. uh, I got to visit Cartwright's grave and uh, and while I was in the Bishop Museum in uh, Honolulu, there was a placard, uh, you know, a kind of handbill uh, that was uh, pasted up on display about uh, some guy in the in the shipping business, you know, who was caught on <laughs> the whale the whale oil shipping business. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of uh, connections to that. The interesting thing is when I started reading John's book many years ago, in 2011 when it came out, um, all of a sudden I started reading about these new names, you know, that John started to throw around, uh, you know, about you know who the early Knickerbockers and other movers and shakers in that very early 18, late 1830s, early 1840s period. Um, and to realize that really Cartwright didn't play anywhere near the role we thought he played. Uh, of Monica Lucioni of our committee did a wonderful uh, biography on Cartwright uh, that talks about the man and the myth. And uh, a lot of it is a myth. You know, mm -hmm. he, he did like kind of fill in, and a lot of that was kind of some subterfuge by one of that his one of his grandsons or something like that. Maybe modifying his diary wasn't exactly the Johnny Appleseed of uh, American baseball. Yeah. So uh, John began in this book to begin to shed light. You know, that secret history was a secret history. Uh, not that anybody, you know, purposely made it secret, but it, it kind of got buried for a long time. And uh, John did some yeah. excellent research to begin to uh, and, unfold. I, I felt. In that respect, Pete, I nominate the good children of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, who in 1791 created enough of a ruckus around the town hall that they got a law passed banning it and, and, and broke themselves into history. Yeah. And in the process, opened our eyes eventually to the reality that the game's been around a hell of a lot longer than anybody even knows. And they probably weren't the first. Right. You know, some of those early clubs just kept some really good records. And I was, what was that? And uh, didn't we have fun, you know, with uh, uh, that book by Peter? Uh, he talks about the early records that the, like the Knickerbockers kept, which really did a good job of just saying, indicating how, not so much how the book began, how the sport began, but just how it developed. And, uh, and, uh, mm. and Peter gave them a lot of credit in that book. And, and, and I think it's somewhat deserved too. Yeah. The Knickerbockers, if anything, they were excellent uh, record keepers. In this sense. Record keepers, and, yeah. And and be and being so, I mean that that becomes the history we learn. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there's such a there's such an obvious source in a way. Uh and John kind of got behind a lot of that. 
you know, I can remember him talking about the uh, New York Mercury and these uh, underground type of newspapers that were, uh, you know, being circulated and, uh, you know, kind of off color stuff, you know, having to do with, uh, you know, nightlife in New York and gambling and so forth and so on. And, uh, John was like one of the first guys, I think, that really began to, um, if not the first, who really began to mm. explore those resources. Yeah. I have a question about the Knickerbockers that maybe someone can clarify. Mm. Um, I've got the book right here. There's a photo. It's a very famous photo. Maybe you can see it here. Maybe you've seen it before. I'm trying to hold it up there. Or right, well, what page is that on? It's the second page of the photos that are inserted. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a photo section. There's here. six guys wearing straw hat. Okay. Again, I, I think a lot of you have seen this photo. I'm yeah. trying to hold it up to the yeah. Sure. Right? Yeah. It's a it's a daguerreotype. John says in the book it was taken in 1845. Randall Brown says it was 1849. Mm. Okay. Who's in the picture? Um, five of the people in the picture seem there seem to be confirmed identities, but the sixth one isn't, and that's the guy in the upper left. John says it's William Wheaton. Randall Brown says it's Walter, I think Walter Avery. Mm. Does anybody, uh, John wrote this book in 2011. I've talked to John about this. He mm. stands by his ideas. But Randall Brown wrote two years later that he did a comparison between the guy in this photo and a contemporary photo of William Wheaton. And he says it's not William mm. Wheaton. He thinks it's Walter Avery, who was another official on the Knicks. Does oh, yeah. anybody know? And I'm asking for a reason. Um, in 2023 at the Fred, I did a presentation on the Elysian Fields. Mm. And but it was short <laughs> because they only gave me 20 minutes and five minutes for QA. So I left out most of the baseball stuff because the guys at the Fred already know about the baseball at the Elysian Fields. I wanted to talk about what else went on at the Elysian mm. Fields. Tomorrow, I'm giving an extended presentation at the Stevens Institute of Technology uh, in Hoboken, where I live, and it's going to be an hour, and I'm going to put all the baseball stuff back in. And of course, I want to address the whole myth that surrounds me as a longtime Hoboken resident that baseball was invented here, the first game was played here, Alexander Cartwright is the granddaddy of baseball i'm going to correct a lot of those um misconceptions and i'm going to show this photo and i i guess i want to have a couple of ids confirmed of who's hmm. in it um and the other thing i want to be able to say what is the big deal about the june 19th 1846 game that is celebrated when we know that the knickerbockers played at least 34 games before then in Hoboken. Why is the June 19th, 1846 game such a big deal? Because what you're not accounting for are the years and years and you know of research that has slowly uncovered these things. So I would ask you with back, Erwin, is when did you ask John who was in this photograph? And was the other Craig Brown, did you say? Randall Brown. I oh, found Randall that Brown. I found at protoball.org. Okay. Randall, I think his name was Randall Brown, right? He's the mm -hmm. one who found we're really going into protoball geekery here, but that's why we're all here. He he's the one who found the 1887 interview in the San Francisco Examiner with an old pioneer who's not identified, but is William Wheaton. Right. And he's recollecting the days of uh, the Knickerbockers discovering the Elysian Fields and making it their home field. And he even references he himself having authored the rules 
for the 1837 New York Gotham mm -hmm. team. That's how they know it's Wheaton. Um, so when did I talk to John about this? John and I have been going back and forth for the last two years as I developed the presentation for Fred and the presentation for tomorrow. And I love John. I'm, he's, his, his memory is encyclopedic. We all love John. Um, he's not here. So I don't want to say anything mm -hmm. negative about him. But I think in some cases, John can be a little stubborn about <laughs> something he considers to be a fact. And if someone else wants to disprove it, I don't know that John is necessarily receptive to that. Um, in this case, he stands by the fact that it's Wheaton. I don't know. I don't want to argue with John. Um, um, look, John is the source of so much information I'm going to be using tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm indebted to him. I, the book is remarkable. That's why I'm here on, on this Zoom. Um, I just wish I knew if he had any doubt about mm -hmm. that, whether that is, in fact, William Wheaton in the, uh, in the upper left. Okay. I don't okay. recall this too much. Uh, I don't. I don't recall this exactly, but another Brown by the name of Craig Brown. Nope, Craig mm. Brown is no, no, the no, no, uniform guy. Minute. Hang on a second. Craig okay. Brown is a member of our committee also, and I, I know the difference between Randall Brown and Craig Brown. <laughs> it's two very good people, but uh, Craig just recently did an analysis of this photograph uh, and posted the results of that on his website, uh, Threads of the Game, under the title hmm. of the Knickerbocker team. And you're going to see what he actually concentrates on because of the hats. Uh, what about those Panama hats? And, you know, what do they represent? Yeah. And, and how do they Look differ right. from each other? And he may have, I don't recall exactly, but I think he also identified the people in these photographs, in this photograph. And uh, I would, before you go to bed tonight, <laughs> I'm going to read it. On that I'm going to reread it. I'm going to reread it. I read it. You're right. And I forgot about it. But yes, I, I, I love Craig's work. He does great work. He, and, and another thing about Craig and John, they, they care about facts. They don't care about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. And yes. I respect that. So does Tom Gilbert. Same thing. They don't like mm -hmm. speculation. They don't like guesswork. They yeah. like pinning down something as being factual. I appreciate that. Yeah. And Craig Craig Brown is that way. Yeah. Well, I would they, love to take uh, a been... local vacation day and come to Hoboken tomorrow if no one on here tells my board of education that I won't be in. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Where do you live? I live in the, the Binghamton, New York area. I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it off, but it's an afternoon thing. It's uh, from it four awesome. to six, <laughs> awesome. uh, and I've got a lot of period visuals, including yeah. uh, all the all seven known illustrations of baseball being played at the Elysian Fields in the 19th century, and the only photo, which is the wow. one that John Popovich found, which was a real inspiration for me doing this presentation. Yeah. John found a CDV of baseball being played around 1865, 1866 in Hoboken. It's the only mm -hmm. known photo. Wow. Thousands of games and no well, one and, picture. I, and I think you bring up a really interesting point about like why this, why that game, right? There are so many other games beforehand that we know happen. And Thorne on page 97 starts talking about the wrong sort of people getting their, their tentacles in the game. And since they were gaining a foothold, he writes, the fastidious chroniclers of the game elected to start baseball's Book of Genesis with the Knickerbocker Baseball Club. You're, you're talking about the Magnolia team. That, was, the, the, that wrong sort of people? Yes, the Magnolia so there's this, team. There's this tension, right, between the clerks and the, 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 the you know, the, the emerging, whatever you say, leisure class and the ruffians at the gate and, and Thorne sort of sets up this dynamic of there was a concerted effort to keep the wrong folks out. And it ties into his conversations about gambling, which I found really fascinating as, as he really emphasizes that gambling was one of the movers 
you know, you grow up and you think like, oh, gambling was 1919. And then obviously it's much more than that. Um, but, you know, do, does, do, do we think that Thorne sort of overstates, for example, gambling's contribution to the acceleration of the game? He talks about gambling, statistics, and publicity on page 87. But he really hones in on gambling more than I had read as being a reason why people grew this game versus the pure love of baseball, which, right, I think we all want to believe. Uh, I don't think I don't think he's overstating it. Um, I, I think baseball did attract a, um, a kind of a ruffian element. Um, and as I'm going to make clear tomorrow when I talk about the Elysian Fields, the Elysian Fields were for the uh, the upper class, the gentry mm -hmm. up until 1831 when it was open to the public. Within four years, mm -hmm. there are newspaper stories about how the Elysian Fields have gone downhill. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just ruffians and, and, and some fight muggers and Germans rapists. The Dutch at some point. I there were a I lot of saying. Germans there having their Mayfest, having you know, in their beer gardens. But it was opened to the middle and lower classes, and they came over by the tens of thousands on the ferries. Sports. And it, there were riots, there were suicides, there were murders, there were rapes, there were missing people, there were abductions, there were uh, con artists. Yeah, it, it really became a very seedy place over the course of its existence. I don't think it's much different now to then than it is now. I mean, look, look what major sports were then, boxing, horse racing, and baseball. And, and what, do, what do they have in common? You know, they're all kind of around gambling. Mm. Uh, that's why baseball has kind of wanted to regulate and control that until fairly mm. recently and still do to some degree but and i think and it does correct me if i'm wrong guys but tom gilbert does go into great detail in his book um how baseball happened in that whole world of uh, that that takes place in new york around those times too so another great book by the way yeah, I, I tell people who want to know about early baseball, read Garden of Eden, how baseball happened, and David Block's Baseball Before We Knew It. Mm -hmm. Those to me are just the three um, foundational books about, you know, what we're talking about here. Well, it's kind of, yes, we're also interesting. Uh, we did this uh, in 2014. We did a greater New York City. We ended up later on doing Brooklyn separately. Of course, we really understood that we needed to speak more about Brooklyn. But in, mm -hmm. in 2014, we did an uh, interdisciplinary symposium uh, at uh, in Manhattan at John Jay College. And it was a uh, interdisciplinary symposium on 19th century baseball. And of course, the Legion Fields figured heavily into the uh, into that presentation. But in that during that presentation, there were two presenters that we had about three presenters that were non-baseball historians. One was a distinguished professor from Rutgers, Ann Fabian, who had written a book on 19th century gambling. Mm. And it's a book that, uh, as she described it, uh, the card catalog, uh, you know, it was one of the most worn out cards in the card catalog. <laughs> Everybody was examining it and writing about it or doing whatever about it. And uh, it's kind of interesting how ubiquitous gambling was in the 19th century. And then our other presenter was a technology historian who came from SUNY Albany. Hmm. And he came down to New York to do his presentation on what was essentially what he called the, the, the uh, Internet of the 19th century. Which hmm. telegraph? Sure. So, yeah. and he talks about the telegraph and its interfacing with baseball. And if you know when the telegraph came into existence, it was in the 1840s, uh, right around the same time that these teams were coming into existence. And it didn't take too many, too long, you know, a number of years, but it didn't take too long for the telegraph to become ubiquitous in terms of gambling and baseball. The sports bar of the 19th century didn't have big screen TVs, <laughs> but they all had a ticker tape. <laughs> yeah.
So, I mean, those three things, gambling, statistics, publicity, <laughs> go hand in hand in many ways. But was it the publicity that brought the gamblers and then the statistics developed because we need a way to measure? Or is it the gambling that the newspapers saw like, wow, there's crowds around this. Let's post these statistics. I mean, there's probably not a right answer, but like, is there a chicken or an egg argument to be made about which of those three contribute the most to the game's growth? Gambling, publicity, and what was the third? Question. It's a matter, of, a matter of cause and effect. Mm. And uh, it doesn't strike me that gambling would have been a cause of all these people coming to ball games and development of statistics and whatnot. Mm. It seems like that would be an effect. There's a correlation sure. between the development of gambling and, and baseball. But that doesn't mean necessarily that it was causing the development. True. Gambling only matters if there's competition. There was no competition at first. It was they were clubs, choose right. sides. Nobody cared about the outcome because as soon as the game was over, they were going to go have a banquet anyway. <laughs> um, once teams started having um, uh, uh, fans, followers, people who actually rooted for them, and they started. Um, raising the stakes of the game and acquiring players who were more skilled, thats that was the opportunity for gamblers to get a piece of the action when there was actually the outcome, the outcome mattered. I think eventually it did. You take mod modern organized crime, you know, <laughs> well, now they have gambling next online. But, uh, you know, I worked on organized crime in New York City and, you know, one of the things was, you know, Baseball gambling was separate, you know, because it, it wasn't a point system. It was an odd system. And it had to do with game outcome. Mm -hmm. But early gambling on the game was a pool gambling. And it was a bookmaker in the stands turning around and just saying to the guy, I'll bet you uh, the next pitch is a strike or, or a hit. Or I, I think this guy will get a hit. What do you think? You know, and then wager on it. And eventually, of course, they did come to outcomes of games. You know, as teams became more important, as Owen says, when they developed the fan base. But that very early game, it could be very spontaneous. And there's a lot of uh, kind of reports of gambling of that style. Uh, you know, what's going to happen yeah. on the next pitch? What's going to happen on the next set back? You know? Prop bets, we'd call them these days, right? <laughs> kind of, I guess. Larry, you talked about the um, the sort of the rougher element mm -hmm. being involved in the in the early years of the sport and how a lot of them were written out of the histories because the Knickerbockers were gentlemen. A lot of the teams were gentlemen. Um, they shared a trade. They came from the better neighborhoods. They had more money. They had free time, for God's right. sake, to play baseball. Yeah. Um, but John talks about the Magnolia team. He found that card, which mm -hmm. is the earliest, he calls it the earliest representation of adults playing baseball in America. And it's at the Legion Fields. And it's 1844. Mm -hmm. you know, that's two years before the Knickerbockers. Yeah. And John yeah. believes, and I, as I understand it, there's a lot of research going on now. Tom Gilbert has talked about this, as has Thorne into the Magnolias and why were they written out of this history? Mm -hmm. Why were they excluded? And the reason he feels is because they were, uh, you know, ward bosses and just tough people, um, seedy characters who mm -hmm. wanted to play the game, but they were not respectable. Um, and that's some of the research that's going on. I, at some point, I'm sure someone's going to do a great presentation at the Fred mm -hmm. about the Magnolia team. When I say team, I'm club, of course. They're they're clubs, they're not even teams. Yeah, that that was another great example of a something that was completely bypassed. In fact, David Block had I believe had first discovered this photograph. And you know, in looking at it, he came to recognize really that this was 
something that was not, this is actually an invitation mm. to an event that the Magnolias are, you know, taking part in or hosting, uh, as a baseball player. So, uh, and that is, uh, very, uh, <laughs> a very stretched imagination or image of the Elysian Fields that is supposed to be the, uh, you know, the, the mansion there that they it's the Colonnade to... Hotel. Colonnade Hotel. And then okay. that's the South Field. There was a North Field north mm. of the Colonnade Hotel and Tavern, which yeah. the, it wasn't even called the Colonnade at that point. I think it was called McCarty's. McCarty's. Her name yeah. Michael McCarty bought it in 1841. Um, it lasted until about 1890, the colonnade, mm. but it kept changing owners and changing names. It was Rodenberg's, I think, before it was demolished around 1890. Mm. But it's in a lot of images of the Elysian fields. It was very important. That was the opening of the fields. When Stevens' family built the colonnade in 1831, there was a grand celebration. It was in July, 1831. Mm. That was when they started referring to it as the Elysian Fields, and that's when they opened it up to the public. So it, it started going downhill immediately, and it became <laughs> more and more popular. Interesting. Yeah, and so there's not only this competing which club is the Book of Genesis, but then also, you know, these different versions of the game. And on page 112, Thorne talks about the, I love this quote, the prissy New York game becomes the national pastime. Um, but there's these other versions, the Massachusetts game, Philadelphia, probably others. Um, so, I mean, how, how does he situate the New York game as becoming what we know as the national pastime, whereas these other, and in some ways, arguably maybe more exciting versions of the game sort of get phased out? My guess it was just a gradual consensus of what was better, what mm. was more fun, what seemed more coordinated and more organized. It's what people wanted to do. People were free to continue playing the Massachusetts game, which mm -hmm. used five bases. Yeah. But I think more people began to realize that four had maybe had a certain symmetry Mm -hmm. That was more pleasing. It was less complicated having four bases than five. So four bases eventually won out. Um, the Knickerbockers were great um, champions of the New York game. They're from New York. Um, Chadwick, of course, also mm -hmm. contributed to uh, the popularization of the game. Um, and the... the um, the, the evolution of the rules as well with suggestions. But yeah, the Knicks uh, codified some of the rules when mm -hmm. Wheaton did with the Gothams in 1837. Then there were the two big meetings, what, in 1857 and 58, um, where all these clubs met in New mm -hmm. York to try to standardize the game so they could play each other and know mm -hmm. what the rules were so there was no misunderstandings if, if something happened on the field. Yeah. Other the Nationals, you know, I mean, the Nationals tour of 1866 was mm -hmm. preceded, uh, I believe, by the Excelsior's tour upstate and into New England. And I mm -hmm. think that when they began to play the New York game in front of the New Englanders, it was like this obvious... Uh, uh, something probably uh well so they were expert at what they were doing and they were like kind of seamless and you know they were it suddenly became the uh, game of choice it, it became this is a better game you know i think that's all part of it uh, and uh i think john you know uh, he does talk about the of course the tour the national tour which is a tremendously important uh you know, having to, to went out to the Midwest, went out to the Chicago area, Rockford, and uh, you know, naturally that gave the game that much more of a boost. But that mm -hmm. those earlier tours, north of, of New York City and then and then south of New York City, uh, really did a lot to spread that game. 
and uh, you know, we spread the New York game, uh, the game mm-hmm. that the Knickerbockers essentially, uh, you know, uh, almost came to dominate at least in the New York game. Another Although, uh, super spreader of baseball was the Civil War. Yeah. In fact, yeah. they they weren't playing too much what passed for organized baseball in 1861 because of so many of the young players had uh, enlisted with the Union Army. And baseball really didn't start coming back until 1862, 1863. Mm-hmm. And they were playing it in the, the prisoner of war camps. Wherever they w- were, they were trying to get together games and introducing it throughout the South. Um, uh, Confederate prisoners who were being held in the North got to see baseball being played. Civil War really helped popularize the game. And oftentimes in the Civil War, people are leaving their little enclave for the first time in their life. And if they're coming back alive, they, you know, they're, they're being able to spread some of these ideas. And so we've talked about the Nationals tour, the, the Red Stockings go in 1869. And I think Thorne sort of situates those events as really spreading not just this version of the game, but this idea of clubs kind of playing each other and traveling and the better clubs forming their own groups, um, well, which gets us into the 1870s as well. It, it seems to me that a lot of the New York games benefit was simply because it was New York, the big mm. city with a whole lot more newspapers and a whole lot more teams. More uh, money. And and as people, as newspapers tried to syndicate or the equivalent of syndication in, in the days and, and reports came about this, that, or the other, you know, that was the game. I think Erwin is correct, though. It, the, the style of play in the game was, was appealing to a broader uh, uh, group. But I don't see the Massachusetts game being played much outside of Massachusetts mm-hmm. or Connecticut or Southern New Hampshire. Uh, they just, they liked their game. They played their, their game, mm-hmm. but it got very much the, the idea of publicity came through uh, that you were talking about earlier. It was always around a New York team. Mm-hmm. We tried to, we tried to recreate a game in 1825, um, having no written rules to go from uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and of course the community of Hamden, New York is coming up on its bicentennial next year, yeah. which also coincides with the July 12th, 1825 challenge of bass ball, uh, B-A-S-S hyphen ball. And um, you know, we're going to, we're going to try to recreate that game again, of course, with things like soaking the runner, um, uh, uh, you know, every, every, uh, all out one out, all out, uh, like, so there was variations on the game of, you know, people like where every batter has to get put out. Um, you know, obviously no foul territory. It's very interesting to, to try to play this game in 1825. There's no equipment. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So what, no, what, yeah, what, no gloves, what no, no, you had to build, you had to make your own ball. There were no bats. Yeah. There were no yeah, bases. We, and, and, and if no you uniform. can find me the eye of a sturgeon, uh, I, I'd really appreciate it. Um, yeah. In fact, the one time we did this, we did this for the Zane Gray Museum in Lacoax in Pennsylvania a few years ago. And wouldn't you know it, the first time, uh, the first pitch, like one of the first batters, I mean, it wasn't the first pitch, one of the first batters proceeded to hit the ball over the fence, into the railroad tracks, into the weeds. And it was a nice teachable moment for the crowd. And I stopped and I stopped everybody as it took them 10 minutes to find this one baseball we had. And I said, do you think they would, that back then when they had one baseball that was hand stitched, they would have been rewarded by touching all the bags, uh, you know, in this uh, case, the posts, or would they have probably just kicked the guy out? So just, you know, <laughs> you're, you're fired because, you know, well, now we yeah. don't have a ball to play with. <laughs> but yeah and what's interesting about the town of hamden and you know you mentioned about you know not having not doing guesswork and trying to pinpoint this down what i find interesting about um the the town of hamden was formed by men that had moved there from the springfield massachusetts area 
Interesting. And yeah. So if you think about that, in 1791, you have Pittsfield and this mention of baseball in town. You know, I, it does lead me one to believe that those those men's fathers would have been the ones playing those games in the 1790s, <clears throat> and the, and then they come here in 1825 and found founded Hamden. And they're looking for somebody to play baseball with and had to and had to take out an ad in the local Delhi Gazette to do that. So it's a leap. But, you know, I, I kind of have to go from that 1825 and look backward and say, OK, wh where do we go from where do we go? And, and it, I'm sort of led back to that central Massachusetts area. And then it begs that question, was it the Massachusetts game or was it town ball uh, or some variation on the theme there? Um, so it, it it's it, and, and as to, as the bicentennial comes up, there are people that are going to be writing about this game and they're not going to I guarantee they're not going to do the homework they need to to really talk, talk about it in a, in a meaningful way. But it's it's still a lot of fruit for research there. And um you know, that goes beyond just census records. Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically what we can get from the nine men who supposedly played this game. And that's the other, that's the other knock against this is that we know that they challenged for a game, but we don't actually know if they ever right. played it because right. there was no written account of the game. Like the Jones or Tree game, right? Yeah. I know Bill Humber wanted to say something. Well, I just wanted to throw a rhetorical bomb into the mix here. <laughs> Do we make too much of the of the New York centric view of baseball's development? In other words, I would argue that the initiatives regionally, be they in Boston or Philadelphia or Cincinnati or the Niagara region, and the area that I'm particularly uh, interested in, South Southern Ontario, they these areas had a well organized structure to them. They had um, a, a defined set of rules in a lot of cases. They had organized teams, et cetera, et cetera. So when the New York rules come along, um, it wasn't that big a leap for them to adopt them. They had many features that were preferable perhaps to what you know was broadly called the old fashioned game. And the old fashioned game had two basic features to it, a very soft ball that couldn't be hit very far and then a 360 degree playing surface. Mm -hmm. And the New York game is focused on a much harder ball, which makes for a, for want of a better term, a more manly scientific game, more in the order of cricket, right? More similar to kind of the, you know, baseball was looked down upon because even up until 1865, you, you know, you could get that fly catch on on one bounce. So there, there were a lot of aspects to it that were, to a cricketer look childlike. And so my argument would be to look at those regional places in which the game was being played and to suggest, and here's this, I'm gonna make this suggestion, without those regional places, the New York game may never have become what it became because mm -hmm. it needed those places to almost accept it as a landing spot because it was already so well organized in those places. Yeah. Is that enough of a rhetorical bomb? Yeah, well, look, <laughs> it, 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 bat and ball games have been played throughout history. Someone's got a stick and someone's got a rock and someone's going to throw the rock and someone with the stick is going to hit it. At some point, someone came up, some kid came up with the idea to run to a, a safe post or something. So bat and ball games in that sense were played everywhere. They certainly weren't New York centric. So... Um, as this game evolved in the early 19th century and it traveled, I think it was building on the, the its its more primitive variants in any given region, if that's what you're talking about. In other words, there was something there to build on already. Mm. They already were using bats and balls and you know striking at at a thrown pitch or something. Well, and they, and they had they they had their own rules, and in a mm. way. Those rules were no more or no less primitive in some respects of the New York game rules, which, mm -hmm. you know, we think of as somehow sophisticated. But really, that, that game, that New York game looked more like softball 
um, than it would look like baseball today as as we know it, just because of the you know distances between the the pitcher and the batter, the way the ball was thrown underhand, et cetera. So it it you know New York obviously has this prime place in 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 the American situation because of its importance economically, civically, um, media wise, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I can gotcha. say this having you know looked in detail at Southern Ontario, New York played virtually no role at all in in mm. how the game grew in that organized fashion, other than the adoption of the New York game rules, which essentially did away with the, the softball in place of a hardball and reduced the playing surface from 360 degrees to 90. That was the primary thing. But in every other feature, the game was structured, played by, well-organized, et cetera, et cetera. So as, as I, you know, said on Tuesday, it's not surprising the first international game is played in 1860, you know, before the Civil War between teams from yeah. ostensibly, you know, uh, uh, Hamilton and, and Buffalo. Um, already it was very well. And I wish people would spend more. This is my final wish and then I'll shut up. I wish people would spend more time looking at those regional initiatives in baseball in those those early years pre pre-1860, because I, I suspect that there's a wealth of history and story and organization, et cetera, there that is yet to be uncovered, because I, I found it in Southern Ontario. If it's Southern Ontario, it's going to be in all these other places. It's going to even sure. be more so, I think, in many of these other places in the United States. But it was the New York game that became dominant not because it was imposed on anybody it got traction wherever it went i, I just I, again it wasn't imposed on people they were making their choices slowly gradually over the course of decades and deciding again four bases better than five um three outs better than i don't know 12 whatever mm -hmm. just deciding that there were certain rules that made better sense that made the game more enjoyable i don't think there was ever any you're almost um i understand what you're saying mm. and i'm basically saying that they were seeds of baseball everywhere and they blossomed but eventually it was the new york game that took root wherever this these seeds existed because it came to be a preferred way of playing the game uh, and when you and you when you have two competing teams they have to agree on the rules yeah oh, absolutely but I, th I think the key one was the harder ball. It could be hit farther. It it required greater skill to play with. It made the game have that kind of challenging scientific thing that people seem to like, comparable to what cricket had. And I think the other tremendous, you know, significant development was in effect the 90 degree, you know, playing surface rather than the 360 degree. So suddenly if you're a spectator, you know, I, I, I don't know if anybody's ever been to an international cricket match, but regardless of where you sit, you're a long way from the action. And you, you really kind of feel, wow, well, there, there's the, the wicket out there, but it's a 360 degree. <laughs> it doesn't lend itself to spectatorship the way that baseball does. Well, the, to the interesting thing to me about all of this isn't necessarily the rise of the growth of baseball. It's the growth of competition. Mm. In baseball and and in other sports, golf comes in a mm. in a competitive way about this time. It's been around before, but uh, and 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 uh, horse racing, the Kentucky Derby, the Belmonts, they come in about this time. Um, boxing, the the notion of world champion is starting to take hold. About pretty close to the same era, uh, football is going to begin in 1869. Uh, uh, it strikes me that that's the element that maybe we ought to focus on a little bit more is the what drove the notion of competition in baseball or anything that didn't, it, it, the best of my knowledge, didn't exist in 1830 or 1820, but it did exist all of a sudden in the 1840s and beyond. You know, what I find amazing too is when I look back on it, and I'm always fascinated by the uh, fashion racehorse game, uh, uh, racehorse uh, game, you know, the uh, all-star mm -hmm. game that pitted the all-stars in Manhattan against the all-stars of Brooklyn. That game was played in 1858. The game was only officially codified uh, for, you know, uh, 
a number of teams uh, by Doc Adams, in, uh, you know, who's with, with, uh, writing the rules of baseball in 1857. So by 1858, you actually have an all-star game. Now think about that for a moment. Mm. I mean, you know, an ultimate competition. These are the best players, and these are the best players, and they're going to play each other. <laughs> you know? And spectators. But I always find that kind of amazing, like a leap. And spectators, like leap. people who actually mm. wanted to yeah. see yeah. Hey, they, what was going hey, on. Hey, hey. Right. Yeah. The first paid admission. We're probably gambling you know, on it. I was just going to throw something out real quick. Uh, I wonder if there's anything to say or do with a couple notions where I picked up something that I thought was interesting where uh, Thorne made a point where he said something about when they moved the Massachusetts game into the actual New York game, a lot of the old players stepped away. Mm -hmm. He made a comment about that where he said, you know, some of these guys that are older, they they couldn't handle the the more physical game or the, you know, the, 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 the further running and everything, it was more of a condensed game. So I was wondering, you know, how much of that had to play with it. You know, if you have younger players, maybe you're going to play a more competitive game. Sure. You know, you've also got a situ you know, in the 1850s, a whole muscular Christianity movement where mm -hmm. it's like, Hey, this is, you know, we're going to play this game. It's a more hard game. It's this, but I think uh, we were talking a little bit about the fields. I think what's interesting too is we talk about the Massachusetts game is this massive, you know, it's it's everywhere. You can hit it backwards. You can hit it everywhere you're looking at. You know, one of the first previous books we talked about was the groundskeeper's book. And it talked about the places to play. So if mm. you only have a specific mm. place, like here we can drop a baseball diamond down and we've got this much room, we've got 90 feet in this diamond, you have a lot more room to work with, you know, kind of like you were talking about with your presentation, Bill. Mm -hmm. Look at that perfect plot of land over there by the bridge versus mm -hmm. if that's a Massachusetts game, yeah, maybe we can't do that because it's going to go in a river. Right. So I think it's, there's so many little things that come into play when you're, when you're looking at this, but I, I love your idea. What you were saying earlier, Bill, as well about this, the, you know, the points, like I know for the example, the Niagara is the Richard Bach came from, I believe the Excelsiors and was like, here's the New York game, taught it to him. They had the bylaws in place by 57 and, and it went. So just a couple more points to throw out there. Mm -hmm. And Bob, are we, uh, are we at nine o'clock? Is that where we kind of wrap it up? Oh, we, we, we try to, we've got uh, uh, three more minutes on my, my clock. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, just to tell you, there's no one scheduled behind us. <laughs> well, well, maybe we, you know, there's a lot more stuff to talk about, but I think we're talking, we're kind of talking about how it went from point A to point B to point C. And I've always been fascinated by Henry Chadwick being kind of there seemingly forever <laughs> with this at this point and how he seems to eventually lose out on what he's standing for at the end of it to Spalding and to this whole movement to make Doubleday, you know, what what the myth became i mean did, did it, just a very general question did anyone have opinions on chadwick and just his role in all of the things we talked about the publicity the box score all those kinds of things and just his place in not just this book but in baseball history in general i have something on chadwick and i just want to find the quote once, give me one second, and I will bring it up here. While he's looking, that I was just uh, as as William was mentioning about these um, other developments in different regions. I just thought, well, there there probably will, may there may or may not have been a, a Chadwick equivalent in those other regions, and maybe that's why it, it really sure you know took off you know in the, in the New York area. I mean, right, he just stumbles across this one day and he's like, oh, this game is perfect for Americans. Let me dedicate most of my life to spreading it. That's what I wanted to address. Mm. There's a famous quote um, from Chadwick. I can read it. It's not that long. Uh, and this was published. OK, I chanced to go through the Elysian Fields in 1856 during the progress of a match between the noted Eagle and Gotham clubs. 
Mm -hmm. The game was being sharply played on both sides, and I watched with deeper interest than any previous ball match between clubs that I had seen. It was not long before I was struck with the idea that baseball was just the game for Americans. Mm -hmm. Now, Chadwick at the time was mostly writing about cricket. Mm -hmm. So he had this epiphany in 1856, but he doesn't mention it to anyone until he publishes it in his book mm. in 1868. Mm. So it could be BS. Yeah. It, it could be just hindsight that, hey, let me, let me make this claim that no one can right. disprove. That said, there's no question that Chadwick became one of the driving forces behind the popularity of baseball and trying to keep it uh, respectable. Um, Mm -hmm. you know against the gambling elements and the drunkenness and the and the uh the unsportsmanlike play of certain t uh, teams he was he was old school yeah. he was all for respectability and i think over the course of his career he felt somewhat territorial about it um and for that reason a lot mm -hmm. of people would just see him as some old geezer who mattered 40 years ago and you know the, the game has moved on mm -hmm. i mean he was still writing in the early 20th century yeah mm -hmm. when the when the game had changed incredibly much yeah. since, mm -hmm. since his 1856 epiphany yeah and so, so larry what have we learned about old time this old time 19th century baseball since john wrote that book which is now 13 years ago. Um, do we have new knowledge that challenges some of John's points of view? Do we have other perspectives that have come up? Um, I'm just curious, uh, you know, to hear from people, you know, yeah, I think what's that's a new? Question. Certainly there's people on this Zoom much more knowledgeable than I am about that. Maybe, and maybe we'll just take two or three things and, and that puts us, um, you know, a little after nine, if, if anyone has any thoughts on that. Thank you for that question. Well, John himself said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, John is the only person to repeat being the keynote speaker at the Fred. Uh, mm. So he was our first keynote speaker in 2009. And then he was our keynote speaker again. I, I think it was uh, 2000, was it 19, I think, Bob? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it was 2019, uh, just before the pandemic. And um, when he gave that presentation the second time, he talked about that, how, you know, we've had this kind of uh, explosion in interest. You know, uh, the 19th Century Committee of Sabres is about 700 members. So, you know, having that kind of, uh, call it firepower, <laughs> research power, uh, things are being discovered all the time. Uh, anytime, uh, uh, you know, I, I sit down at this computer and, you know, read, read an email from a member or, uh, you know, come, come to the Fred conference or listen to the 19th century baseball speaker series or the book series or whatever, the book club series. Uh, I'm always learning something. Somebody, somebody is digging into something somewhere in some corner of 19th century baseball and, and surfacing, uh, new information. And I, I think what's happening is, is that, uh, you know, the jig, <laughs> I don't know if it'll ever be filled in, sure. uh, but the jig, big jigsaw puzzle is getting filled in. <laughs> well, you have more and more newspaper archives being digitized and being put online. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go to a library and leaf, yeah. you know, leaf through a whole bunch of uh, books that are, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, bound volumes of 19th century newspapers that are falling apart in your hands as you're turning the pages. You can actually look at this stuff online. So it's easier to research and there's more sources to research. I think it's also, this is just my hunch too, but obviously people know I was deeply disappointed that Doc Adams didn't make this recent classic era ballot, but um but I also think because of the volumes of inf information that have surfaced about the origins of baseball, that it's it's very it becomes more even more difficult to pinpoint 
um, you know, any one individual and put them reams above everyone else. <clears throat> because if you put in a guy like Doc Adams, well, then you get arguments from guys like Richard Hirschberger about, well, what about Wheaton? And now we got to put Wheaton in there. And so to me, it, it bodes well to maybe the hall should really consider uh, a pioneer status. Right. And, and, and maybe only do that on a very exclusive basis once every so often. Um, and then they, they actually recruit folks from this group. I mean, Sabre has had a tremendous influence on, on people in the hall of fame across the board. And, uh, and but what, what, what would be nice to see is if they actually, um, you know, acknowledged a lot of the work here and not, I'm not saying that they haven't, but um, certainly Bud Fowler, it seems is the only one that of, of our overlooked legends that has made it in. And I find that, really really tough to to sit with especially we have our meeting there every year so it's like come on guys throw us a bone uh, yeah. but I'll stop maybe there. they could consider inducting clubs hmm. just, there really are only a handful of those seminal clubs the knickerbockers obviously the gotham who who were also the new york club then became the gotham again but it's the same club yeah um the cincinnati well the members of the cincinnati red stockings a lot of them actually no a lot of them are not in the hall of fame a few are they could consider just inducting certain, you know, pre-professional clubs. The Excelsior, I think, were a, a very important club. Yeah. I can remember uh, the first time I met Marjorie Adams, Doc Adams' great-granddaughter, actually. And Marjorie did a wonderful presentation for us at the thread. She imitated her grandfather being interviewed by a, by a second party. And, uh, you know, she, she, she give his, giving the answers as for the research she had done on her grandfather. But what, what rolled off her tongue immediately was the father of baseball. And I remember, you know, getting to know her a little better and began to plead with her. Don't use that term. Mm. Don't use that term, the father of baseball. Because we have used it so many times a number of times <laughs> to find out that we didn't have the father of baseball. And to say one of the fathers of baseball, one of the pioneers of baseball, yeah. is more accurate, more appropriate, uh, because uh, rather than putting the marbles in that one base, <laughs> and then somebody coming along like, uh, <laughs> you know, like just mentioned to you, and, and suddenly, and you know, you're in that dilemma. Yeah, it was, you know, it was key to put it, that on the on the signage in Mount Vernon in New Hampshire when we had the <laughs> I put a a founding father, not well, and founding that father. that really kind of brings right. us a right founding back to the father, right, 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 a pioneer, so, <laughs> that kind of brings us right, right back to the first question. So thank you everyone for for joining in. I'm going to turn it over to Peter. I learned a ton from this, and certainly look forward to seeing everyone on our upcoming upcoming meetings. Well. Well, first of all, thank you, Larry, for taking on this book. It is a it is a really, really big challenge. It's a very important book. Uh, no one had tackled it yet. <laughs> we opened the door to it. And as you can see, I mean, I know you have this great list of questions here. There's so many, you know, good questions. You have 10 questions here. You know, I mean, we touched on, you know, maybe uh, not even half of them. <laughs> you know, we have four or five questions. And uh, but I do commend you, you know, for tackling this and uh, and raising this discussion. It was definitely a lively discussion. It could go on forever. Uh, Irwin's uh, uh, experiences here really uh, play into it because of his Elysian Fields research and so forth and so on. And uh, good luck tomorrow, Irwin, by the way. Uh, so, uh, well, as I want to say, uh, thank you again. I want to I want to first thank you for that. Uh, this is a uh, great book. I hope everybody uh, could get the chance to read it. Uh, the next book coming up, this is uh, will be our third book uh, for our full season. We have about three books a season, three, three, a book, not a book a month. Uh, this book, of course, is the fourth in the series that have all been presented by Matt Albertson. Uh, 
these books have gotten better and better. <laughs> and on each series, the books, the books themselves have become like thicker and more informative. <laughs> and the series starts, the series is the outside the lines of Gilded Age baseball, baseball of the 1880s, essentially, leading all the way up to the players' strike in 1890. And uh, they have been fascinating books. And Matt is going to be now covering uh, the fourth book in the series. Uh, uh, come on up in December. I think it's on the uh, 19th. Mm -hmm. So uh, he'll be back for our uh, next book theory. I'm also working on Paul and uh, uh, came up with some ideas. Uh, he's been one of our, uh, another, you know, really go-to guy studying <laughs> with his book moderations. And that'll be coming up in the winter, uh, uh, perhaps in doing the January and February uh, on one fictional book, uh, well, non one non-fiction book on the uh, Civil War baseball, and then a fictional book on Civil War baseball. And we had great success with a few of the uh, fictional works of 19th century baseball. And then uh, Matt Albertson may be coming back to do a little bit about in March uh, about the... Uh, New book by Tim Newberry on uh, the uh, Louisville uh, team and the uh, you know, Louisville Slugger uh, team, Pete Brown. And, you know, it's essentially a biography of Pete Brown. Okay, so uh, those are all in the in the hopper. Uh, Bob, did you want to uh, add anything? Oh, we uh, just no, want to. No, it's just that it, uh, um, it was a, a fun fun night. I think it it shows you that the. the scope of John's book is so wide that you know you could take a chapter and fill it every every month and we would never exhaust it but thanks everyone for uh, uh, joining us thank you Larry for preparing and leading the conversation and we look forward to you coming back another time uh other than that gentlemen have a good evening well uh, yeah I'd just like to add one well. thing if you just watch your emails coming up, uh, for those who submitted research presentations for the Fred, probably uh, right at uh, probably right around the Thanksgiving time frame, I'll be uh, coming out with the uh, uh, the judges uh, scores for the abstracts, and uh, if the abstract has been accepted or not. Um, on uh, our winter issue of our newsletter. We will have a page again dedicated to the January, February, March uh, book club discussions. And uh, also, of course, that's when we kick off registration for the uh, 2025 club. So uh, thank you again. And uh, Bob, thank you. And Larry, thank you. Good night, all. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone and everybody. Good night.